Nigerian leaders yesterday celebrated Easter with Christians and advised them to apply the essence of the occasion as lessons for the country. Edo State Governor Mr. Godwin Obaseki urged Christians to reflect on the lessons of Easter celebration, saying they should not lose hope amid the economic headwinds in the country. While Delta State Governor Sherif Oberwori also urged Deltans and other Nigerians to show love to one another and be willing to make sacrifices for the greater unity, peace and progress of the country. On his part, Chairman of Northern States Governors Forum and Governor of Gombe State, Alaji Muhammadu Inuwa Yahaya, called for prayers for sustained peace and stability in Gombe State, the Northern region and Nigeria as a whole. Kogi State Governor Usman Ododo, in a press statement by his special advisor on media, Ismaila Issa, urged the people to remain united and resilient in the face of economic challenges. Ododo stated that the promises of renewal and hope associated with Easter would usher in greater prosperity for the people of the state. Still on the Easter celebration mood, Archbishop Emeritus, His Eminence, John Cardinal Onayekon, says the commemoration of the death of Christ by Christians across the world should go beyond eating and merriment, but should transcend into fashion in a way to create peace amid crisis that is daily bedeviling the world. What Pope Francis said today in the Vatican sums it all up. And extends the meaning of Easter beyond just we who are Christians and who celebrate this feast in a very special way. Because Pope Francis has made it clear that Easter has a meaning for the entire universe, for the whole world, the for the global world. And that when we, we, we are talking about the problems we have in Nigeria, Pope Francis is telling us that there is problem all over the world. There's crisis all over the world. There are many wars that are taking place, and there are many people that are in a much more serious situation than we are. And Pope Francis says, despite all this, we must hold up our, must hold our heads high and live in optimism. Why? Why? Because Easter celebrates a unique event in the history of humanity as far as we Christians are concerned. Namely, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is a unique person in the history of humanity, after he had been killed by his enemies and buried, and on the third day he rose again. The Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Matthew Kuka, has lambasted Nigerian leaders who he said have in the past 60 years looked like men in a drunken stupor, staggering in search for the way home. The cleric in his Easter message on Sunday called on the federal government to come up with a robust template for how it wishes to reverse the current situation and put the country on a path of national healing. Bishop Kuka said corruption over the years and a life of immorality have spread like cancer, destroying all the vital organs of the nation and the result is a state of a hangover that has left Nigeria comatose. As part of measures to curb the current economic woes and curtail hunger among the citizens, the bishop urged the government to come up with some urgent steps to put the nation on the path of healing. Well, happy Easter, Rufai and Dr. Bati, and um, good to see you, Rufai. Um, I, I know you were away on Friday on the day I came back. Mm. But it's, it's just good to see um, messages from world leaders. Mm. I ended with Bishop Matthew Kuka, who didn't spare any words in talking about leaders and leadership in the past few years in Nigeria. What your take on the wishes by world leaders? I mean, good to see you. I will miss you uh, a while you're away. Uh, today is symbolic because um, today is that day that we now understand the essence of Easter after Christ has risen. It's no longer the position we left him, the position of death is risen, and that's the declaration of our hope in Christ. And somebody will wonder, why isn't that the prospect of Nigeria? Why is it not risen all these years? And I like Father Kuka's, Bishop Kuka's homily because it's always a succinct reminder of how we have erred as a nation. We have done a lot. And I'm happy he chatted this back to over 60 years ago, where we had leaders that saw a country with a lot of abundance, but their greed and indiscretion destroyed the country. He also talked about the fact that it's been a constant missed opportunity. 
Nigeria has constantly had. I mean, there are many opportunities we've missed. Okay, take for instance, today we're talking, I was talking on another platform about food. And I said, if the president had utilized the opportunity as a last year when he said he wanted to cultivate 150,000 hectares all over the country, by now we should have some food that will push into the market. If we have used the opportunity to say, okay, what are the logistical problems? What are the legacy problems with producing food in this country? By now, we should be able to solve it. But one year down the line, food inflation is rising, and we are going around in circles because we constantly miss opportunities. This was the same opportunities we missed about 40 years ago when we ought to industrialize the nation, when we had the windfall from crude oil, when Yakubu Gowan said the problem is not money but how to spend it, but at the same time, we ruined our prospects by theft of our leaders. This is the same opportunity we missed with crude oil theft. So the question is, when will Nigeria resurrect to greatness? And it's a question we're not able to answer over six years. And how you answer that question with purpose and integrity. We also had the homily of Anayika, and we also had the Easter messages from other stakeholders like governors, Governor Boriwari said we have to make sacrifices. I keep asking the leaders, what sacrifices do you want the people to make when you are not making sacrifices for the people? You are still the ones that want to live large. I mean, you see the debacle going on in Kaduna State as regards debts that has been left for the incumbent governor. Now you're wondering, okay, the debts that was taken, what was, used, what was it used for? And you talk about sacrifice. But for me, the ray of hope is the fact that a risen Christ signifies risen possibilities. And we can look at this thing. And across the shore, also was a ray of hope in England when King Charles was seen in the church coming out, greeting people, despite his cancer diagnosis, the very first time he's been able to come out to see congregants and the likes. I mean, that's a ray of hope. Yeah. But also the sad and the down path to Easter is the fact that we are celebrating another Abrahamic faith holiday and the war still goes on in Gaza. People are being killed. People are being destroyed. Very soon, we'll have the Muslim holiday celebrations. But insecurity is still the order of the day in the world. Yeah. So, in the spirit of the risen Christ, I pray anything dead in your life will resurrect. Amen. Okay, yesterday I had a conversation with uh, the Archbishop Emeritus, John Cardinal Onayeka, on this same subject. He was a guest on This Day Live, uh, the Sunday talk show. And I referred him, which was what he was responding to in that uh, video that was played, to the uh, message by Pope Francis, his message to the uh, city and the world, uh, Ubi et Obi, in which, you know, Pope Francis reminded everyone that, look, just as uh, Mary Magdalene and the ladies that went to the, uh, to the grave of Jesus Christ asked that, you know, who will run away this heavy stone. But when they got there, the stone had been rolled away. The Pope was reminding everyone yesterday that heavy stones block the hopes of humanity. And it was in this context that he was talking about Ukraine, about Syria, about Gaza, about Lebanon. And of course, Pope Francis said, look, it's God and the power of prayers that will roll away uh, these stones. But you know, human beings also have to respect international principles. And when I asked uh, uh, John Cardinal Nayeka, he echoed the same. I pray God, you know, will transform our circumstances. And as, as Christians, you know, we have hope that God will resolve whatever challenges that we may face. And if you look at the messages by, you know, the uh, Nigerian leaders, be they uh, governors or members of the National Assembly, they too were preaching the same message after a fashion of love, tolerance, unity, eschewing all forms of uh, violence, promoting, you know, uh, sacrifice, because the symbolism of uh, Easter, after all, is the sacrifice that our Lord uh, Jesus Christ uh, made. And today, Easter Monday is just as important. This is the day after Easter. In Eastern Orthodox churches, it is called the Bright Monday. It is called Renewal Monday, with Jesus Christ having established the foundation for the growth of his church. And that's why in many countries today is uh, a public holiday. But while it is in order for you know, the uh, Pope, 
uh, uh, Bishop Kuka, uh, John Cardinal Nayekan, uh, to preach prayer, you know, hope, hard work, you know, and all that. My concern has to do with our leaders. All these governors who issue statements, well, it's even their chief press secretaries issuing these statements on their behalf. The question is, what are they themselves doing to roll away the stones? Yes, God will choose people, as uh, the Archbishop Emeritus was uh, saying yesterday, that will roll away the stones. Where are those people who will roll away the stones in Nigeria? The stones of kidnapping, of banditry, of armed robbery, of violence, of corruption. And it's those same leaders issuing statements that will roll away those stones. One of the issues we discussed yesterday was the gap between private morality and public morality. All our leaders are always going on pilgrimage. Every weekend, they are in church. Every uh, Friday, they are in the mosque. They don't miss any prayer because they, they say they are very devout people. But when it comes to governance, those same principles of piety do not translate into the public space. And that's you know, what I complain about when, when I talk about public morality and private uh, morality and what appears to be the gap in between. And it's in part what uh, Bishop Matthew Hazan Kuka was referring to when he said, look, the Nigerian government has a responsibility to have the right template for moving this country forward. It's because we don't have the right template. That's why we've been engaged in a recursive process in this country. Recursive means you take one step forward, you take two steps uh, backward. And in that is homily, uh, which is uh, what, Father, uh, what Bishop Kuka does every time. He was challenging the political class to provide leadership. I was drawing an example from what has just transpired in uh, Senegal. So going forward, you know, our leaders have a responsibility to imbibe the lessons of uh, Easter, whether you are a Christian or you are a Muslim or a traditional worshiper, the same principles of the life of Jesus Christ, the symbolism of the Son of God applies also to you. How many people are ready to make sacrifice for Nigeria? They say, oh, okay, the budget is this, the budget is that, we're going to borrow money. But our leaders spend the same money on themselves. Jesus Christ lived a life of simplicity and honor and he was crucified for it at the end of the day, but he left lessons in church yesterday. You know, we were reminded only Holy coming on, uh, do this in remembrance of me, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, which is a reminder, you know, always that you have to follow the example of Christ. That's the missing link in Nigeria. Mm. What stands out for me in all of this was the fact that yesterday, Mr. Peter Obi the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, he went to a correctional center in Onitsha, Anambra State, to celebrate mass with prisoners. Okay? And he was reminding them of Mary Magdalene, who was once unholy, but who repented and enjoyed the salvation of Christ. But one drama that occurred during that visit by Mr. Peter B. was that he saw a one and a half year old child there whose mother had been in prison because of 250,000 naira. And that child was also in prison uniform, attending mass. That's an innocent child that has not committed any offense. God knows the thousands of children, innocent people that are in correctional facilities in Nigeria that are wearing prison uniform even when they have not committed any offense. These are the kind of things that our leaders should worry about and make a difference. Rather than issuing traditional priests press statements during religious groups. So it will, be, uh, it will be Ramadan. The same statements will be issued. To what effect, you ask? Absolutely, Dr. Bati. And thank you. I was looking forward to your scriptures this morning, um, <laughs> 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 Pastor Bati. But um, very well said. I just, um, just in summary, in terms of um, my take, when it comes to Easter, it's one of the most, it is actually the most significant celebration in, for the Christian faith because it highlights and celebrates in remembrance of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we look at that and look at the Nigerian context, especially in light of the messages that were um, given by leaders and governors in the, in the country, you would see that Jesus as leader demonstrated by sacrifice, that leadership and sacrifice or sacrifice starts from the top. 
And so if you want to demonstrate love for your people, then you must be willing to take the first step of sacrifice. And so I'm hoping that in the messages that were released by all, and, and in good faith, all the leaders that we spoke about, the governors we, we touched on, talking about sacrifice and remembering, especially this season, that we also remember that sacrifice started from the top because it must start from the head. Leadership by servanthood, by service. We know that Jesus washed the feet of his disciple. He wasn't sitting at the head of the table and expecting to be fed. He was more concerned about the people. And I'm hoping that this lessons from Easter would also translate to reality for a lot of our leaders here in Nigeria. And just to mention that the Pope during his homily, I miss concerns over his health. You know, he wasn't able to attend the Good Friday procession. He had to leave the day before during his service early, but he was able to give his Easter homily where he used the opportunity to call for a ceasefire in, on Gaza Strip and also that um, Hamas releases Israeli hostages. So if you, a, a moment to also um, touch on some international, or, or, or topics of international importance and also calling for peace on, you know, on the Gaza Strip. Move on to our next story this morning. Motivated by the outcome of the recent presidential election in Senegal, which produced 44-year-old Basiru Diomaye Fay as president of the country, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar has called on opposition political parties in Nigeria to learn from the exercise and form a coalition ahead of the 2027 general election. Congratulating the Senegalese president-elect, Atiku said one of the ways to remove APC from office was for opposition political parties to unite into a strong coalition, as was the case in 2015, when the opposition rallied together to remove the People's Democratic Party from power. Already, Atiku, who was the presidential candidate of PDP in last year's general election, the Labour Party, presidential election, Peter Obi, and their counterparts from New Nigeria People's Party, Rabiu Kokonso, had been contemplating a coalition to oust APC in 2027. All right, Rufai, a coalition is the way forward, according to, uh, in terms of lessons learned from the Senegalese um, story. Uh, today, by the way, I meant, we had, it, it had been mentioned earlier on that we have our senior correspondent, Ohi Odiai, on ground. So we will be um, going live to Senegal in the course of the morning's show to bring updates or reports from the um, swearing ceremony. What well, your take on this um, statement by Would Atiku you respect or disagree with Elijah Atiku Abaka? The strength of what happened in Senegal was not a coalition was because of the efforts of the people of Senegal. It wasn't about a coalition. Pastif was not a coalition. And we need to get that right. Pastif was a reaction to the many years of subjugation of Makisa. Makisa's emergence was a reaction of many years of subjugation of Abdullah Wad. The real heroes of what happened in Senegal are the Senegalese people that have decided that, as the French will say, a bar with militarism, and they want to entrench strong democratic values. This was the same Senegalese people that went on the streets when Macky Sall was trying to extend the elections. And it was also a testament to strong institutions. We keep talking about the strong institutions. The real hero of the Senegalese process was the Senegalese judiciary that decided to go against the president in a landmark decision, which is difficult for things like that to happen in this climb. And we have hitherto complained at nauseam as regards how things are done here. The real heroes are the Senegalese people that were never docile. Despite the fact that we Nigerians say we want change, the last election, what was the voter turnout rate? It was less than 50%. 71% of Senegalese turned out out of the voter registration of about 70 million people. So it is those people that constantly say they will put their money where their mouth is. And despite the fact that they have divisions, they're going to rally around. Yesterday I did a cursory study of the, the regions in Senegal that was won by the incumbent now, uh, Basiri Jamaifai, and those won by Amadou Ba. It still shows that there's a big division in the country but these people decided to allow their voices to be heard. So what the Nigerian people should learn is that despite how imperfect our democracy is, we must stand up for it and come out. Secondly, we must force the institutions to do what is right. Thirdly, we must have patriots 
that can collectively speak for the betterment of our country, irrespective of their selfish interests. And that was what we saw in Senegal. And those things were built around ideologies over the years of transparency and fairness and integrity. The big question to Nigerian political class is, do we have it? Will our politicians let the judiciary be? Go ahead. Okay, what I understood uh, uh, Waziri Adamawa Atiku Abubakar to be saying was the point that we have always made in, within the context of the uh, process in Senegal that there are lessons for Nigeria and other African countries to learn from what has happened in Senegal. And the main point that he made is that uh, Basiru Faye's emergence shows that there is hope for the future of constitutional democracy in Africa. And the, it shows the hope for constitutional democracy to the extent that every attempt that was made by uh, the ruling uh, uh, party, mm -hmm. led by Macky Sall, uh, first to put in the third, third term through the back door field, to subvert the constitutional process field, and at the end of the day, the constitutional court intervened, and the will of the people prevailed, the rule of law prevailed. If you break down the point that uh, Atiku Abubakar was making about triumph for constitutional democracy, that, this, that is the ingredient. In other words, what we have in Senegal is a triumph of the people's will. The people's yearning for change is what has prevailed. And of course, he pays tribute, he paid tribute uh, to Basiru Faye, who is now the youngest elected African president, uh, just 10 days after he came out of uh, prison. Uh, Atiku Abubakar also made the point about lessons that INEC can learn from the example of the electoral body in Senegal, which is a point again about institutions. And he, 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 he remarked that INEC didn't do well in Nigeria in 2019 and 2023. And that the way you can run a proper election as an electoral empire is to do so on the basis of law and the guidelines of the same institution. So he had a criticism for, uh, for uh, INEC of Nigeria. And then he said, what Senegal has shown is that democracy remains the best form of government. Mm -hmm. Senegal being the most stable you know, uh, democracy in uh, West Africa since 1960, they have not had any coup. So Senegal so, you know, turned the bend. It was a major turning point, and he survived. However... In recommending to uh, Nigeria, you know, in making all of these points that I have outlined, he now said for Nigeria, the way forward is coalition government. And already at the moment, there are indications in the report that some political parties are talking to each other, Labour Party, Social Democratic Party, you know, People's Democratic Party. And it was in that context that he referred to what happened in 2015. You will recall that in 2014, the uh, AMPP, the uh, Action Congress of Nigeria, uh, a, a group of the PDP that called itself New PDP, and also the uh, CP, CPC, uh, the Congress of Progressive Change, uh, Congress for Progressive Change, whatever they call themselves, came together and then formed the APC. And, uh, you know, they took uh, the PDP out of power. However, what uh, Atiku Abubakar and his handlers need to pay attention to is a coalition uh, 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 politics, or what is called the politics of party alliances. It's not a dux machina. It's not automatic. Yes, it's been tried in other parts of uh, Africa, but it's not everywhere that it failed. When a coalition came up in Kenya to take out uh, Kano, uh, the Kano party, right? It didn't quite work. It led into a crisis. It has not solved their problem in, uh, in Malawi, nor in Zimbabwe, nor has it solved the problem in, uh, in uh, South Africa. So it's not automatic that the politics of party alliances, you know, is automatic. It doesn't mean if a uh, uh, PDP, uh, Labour Party, you know, if they come together, it doesn't mean that they will achieve the same kind of success that APC achieved in 2015. And why is that the case? The case is that when Africans talk about political alliances, they are talking about just competition for power. They just want to grab power. 
It's about their own selfish interest. And I will not be surprised why the reason uh, Atiku Abubakar is talking about coalition is because he imagines that he will be the presidential candidate in, uh, in uh, 2027. Okay, what gives him the confidence that even if that coalition emerges that uh, uh, the NNPP, the Kwan Kwan So Party, or the uh, uh, Peter Obi uh, Labour Party, you know, will concede the presidency to him. So the, the basic problem that we have had with uh, coalitions in Africa has been that the attitude of the politicians themselves, because the, the, the purpose is not a common good, mm. it is to grab power, as the APC did in uh, 2015. They just wanted power. They, they, they blackmailed President Jonathan. They demonized the, uh, uh, the government just because they wanted power. They took the power. They've been struggling with it since 2015. So that is the fourth line that we have to look for. Our politicians must change their attitudes. They must pay more attention to the common good. So coalition, we will form coalition. You know, they should study the theory and look at the literature. It's political science. It's not about emotion. It's not about wishful thinking. Pay That's more, my view. Yeah, well, pay more, att pay more attention to the common good of the people. And that was going to be my um, position in terms of, if you look at the Senegal story, and which um, Alaji Atuku Abubaka had alluded to, the people wanted a change. And so we're looking for an alternative to the government of the day. In looking for that alternative, they were also looking for, because there were about 17 um, candidates uh, in, in, in Senegal's election, and they were looking for an alternative to what had been presented by the party in you know, the current government. Now, what Nigerians will be looking for, since we're looking at it from lessons that we can learn as a nation, if, we're looking for an, or if people are looking for an, an, an alternative, is to present ideas to take people out of the current economic situations, ideas that people can believe, ideology that people can believe and hold on to. And if I totally agree with you in terms of, because when you talk about the Senegal story, a lot of spotlight is put on the role of the people who came out to elect. And beyond that, remember that when President Macky Sall tried to move the date, there were protests in Senegal. So the people stood on their ground not to allow an abuse of dem democracy. And the people of Senegal have been able to protect democracy for so for many years. But unfortunately, the electoral class of Nigeria, the the um, the the, the, uh, the, uh, the people of Nigeria, are many many instances. Complacent, complacent, or looking for who is the highest bidder who would give them the 500 naira on the queue. So there, there's a there's a um, talk. There's a role of strong institutions, absolutely, but there's also a responsibility of the people, and that is why it's often said, and I rightly said, that the office of the citizen is the highest office in the land. Beyond political players, beyond political parties, must be a vibrant and strong citizenry who are willing and ready. To to protect their democracy and protect their votes come elections. It's not just to sit and complain, but also to go out and do the work and actually take part in governance in, you know, in, the, in the course of our democracy.